What I'm going to be talking about today is about agricultural commodity price shocks and uh, their effect on uh, economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, my work on commodity prices has mainly been on the univariate study of commodity prices, so looking at trends, cycles, volatility, and persistence. So when I was here on sabbatical recently, Tony and I discussed about doing some work together on looking at how commodity prices can affect growth in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is my first stab at looking at how commodity prices can affect uh, income in sub-Saharan Africa. So to give some introduction, uh, external shocks such as commodity prices, uh, natural disasters, uh, aid volatility, th these are all considered to be reasons for uh, output volatility or in, uh, unstable economic performance in sub-Saharan African countries. So what we're going to focus on here is commodity prices because this has been singled out as one of the primary drivers for uh, uh, income volatility in sub-Saharan Africa. The problem with commodity prices is that they are becoming increasingly variable, and especially since the 1990s, they are becoming increasingly variable. There are broken trends in commodity prices, there, are, uh, there is persistence, which is dynamic in nature. So all these contribute to the difficulty in managing uh, uh, economic policies for uh, th these sorts of movements in commodity prices. So when these sub-Saharan African countries, which are heavily dependent on commodity prices, when they see these large upswings and downswings taking place in commodity prices, it affects their income, and therefore they find it more difficult to deal with these sorts of things. And of course, this has impacts on aid flows as well. It just complicates the whole picture. So there's a large research that has taken place on commodity prices, as I said, trends, cycles, volatility and persistence, and they're all found to change over time, which makes it all the more difficult. So when we start thinking about how commodity price shocks can affect uh, economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa, we need to think about what particular manifestations of commodity prices might affect uh, uh, the incomes in these uh, countries. So what we do in this paper is we choose two particular manifestations of commodity prices, which have been used in the literature, but for different uh, primary commodities. So what we're going to focus on here is agricultural commodity prices, and I've basically used this article by Anderson and Bruckner, where they have done some detailed study by looking at Penn World ta Table data to uh, find out that uh, for the period of time that we're going to consider as well in our paper, that the average share of GDP uh, in sub-Saharan African countries from agriculture has been uh, a considerable amount. So the motivation over here is to study agricultural commodity price shocks on per capita incomes, and particularly what we are going to be interested in is to uh, separate the, the shocks in commodity prices, to divide them into positive shocks and negative shocks, and also within those positive shocks, we look at sustained positive shocks and negative shocks as well. And then we'll do some simulations uh, to find out if we shock this system, how uh, output changes over time. We'll look at a certain horizon, and we'll find out whether there's any difference uh, between these positive and negative shocks. So the question is, what, what sort of price shock are we going to choose? Now, in the literature, there, is, there, there, there are two types of price shocks that have been used for oil price shocks. Uh, one, is, uh, one has been provided by Mork in 1989, published in the Journal of Political Economy, where he divides oil price shocks, oil price movements, rather, into positive and negative movements and traces out the effect of those oil price movements on, on uh, the U.S. economy. And uh, what Mork finds is that positive oil price movements tend to have a more uh, impact on the U.S. economy than negative uh, oil price movements. And since then, this particular model by Mork has become quite popular in the literature on uh, commodity price movements, especially oil price movements. And they have been used in the literature until only recently. Also, uh, Killian, uh, and Killian and Vigfusson have been using this uh, type of uh, study quite a lot. Hamilton, in 1996, and then again in 2003, refined uh, the definition of this oil price shock by talking about a sustained uh, increase in oil prices to be what he calls a net oil price increase or decrease, and what sort of effect that has on 
uh, the, the U.S. macroeconomy or other economies as well. And what it does, what, what they do is uh, Hamilton chooses the current oil price and then measures it against a certain period of time. So if that current price is greater than that oil price over a certain a short interval, then that would be considered as an oil price shock. So basically, it's about commodity price increases that establish new highs relative to recent experience. So let, let's talk about some perceptions of commodity prices, because th these sorts of studies have been used for oil prices. Now, if we talk about commodity prices in general, which include agricultural prices, prices of metals, and other, uh, other primary commodities, uh, the, some of the classic studies, and there, there are other studies as well, but I've just ch ch chosen some of the classic studies. Deaton and Larocque in 1992, in their paper in the Review of Economic Studies, and as, as well as Deaton in 1999 in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, have talked about the nature of commodity prices. They've looked at the, the basic statistics, and what they conclude is that commodity prices are characterized by flat bottoms punctuated with sharp peaks. And these sharp peaks that occur in commodity prices are... Uh, driven by uh, stock outs. So that, that's what causes this sort of movement in commodity prices. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a separate paper, which is more of a policy paper, Deaton and Miller, they point out this, this, this uncertainty about commodity prices makes it all the more difficult and complicated for policymakers to handle these sorts of shocks. So what we plan to do is we plan to borrow these two types of um, shocks that are used in oil prices and use them for agricultural commodity prices. Primarily because in the studies by Deaton, and in also other studies, for example, one study that comes to my mind is a recent study by Harvey, Kellard, uh, Madsen, and Warher. They have used primary commodities, this whole set of 25 commodities over four centuries. And within their group of, or their basket of commodities where they've looked at agricultural prices, which include food and non-food, they've also included oil. And I've also looked at some separate studies. I've done one study myself where I've looked at broken trends in commodity prices and, again, broken trends in oil prices. And they, they, they're characterized by the same sort of movements. There is dynamic persistence in commodity prices. There's also dynamic persistence in oil prices. So in terms of their statistical nature, they're, they're quite similar. So what we have decided to do in this paper is to take these two manifestations of commodity price movements and uh, which are applicable for oil prices and have been studied in the literature quite extensively, especially by Killian and Vigfusson, and uh, see what sort of effect they have on sub-Saharan Africa. So to give a literature review, again, the literature is quite substantial, and so if anyone of you has done some work on this, please don't feel offended if your work is not here. But th this is just, uh, just a, a snapshot of some, some of the studies which I found quite useful. Uh, Easterly, in 1993, they published a paper in the Journal of Monetary Economics where they talk about uh, growth regressions. They, they just model growth regressions, and they find that commodity terms of trade uh, have a significant effect on uh, output volatility. Uh, Mendoza, uh, Coase, and Reisman, uh, they use calibrated general equilibrium models, and they also find a similar sort of result. Mm -hmm. Bleeny and Greenaway, they use uh, panel data, and they find that uh, for variations in output, there is a negative relationship with output. So variations in commodity terms of trade, there's a variation in, in output, and the relationship is negative. Uh, Blackman also uses um, a, a, a certain length of time, which, but, but that's historical data from 1870 to 1939. And again, they find similar results. Agion uses uh, general methods of moments. And again, uh, the results are quite similar, that there is a strong relationship between uh, uh, commodity terms of trade and output volatility. Now, Deaton and Miller in 1996 and Hofmeister and others in 1998, they use a VAR model, and they actually find that the relationship is not so strong as previous studies uh, tend to suggest. But then uh, Broda, Radatz, uh, Collier, and G Goderis in 2012 have used uh, panel VARs. Collier and Goderis actually use a panel ECM uh, to find out the relationship is actually uh, quite strong between uh, commodity prices and, and uh, uh, economic growth. But there are some drawbacks in these uh, studies. And what I'm tempted to pick out is that the dynamics that they assume uh, among these cross-sectional units are relatively homogeneous. Uh, that is not quite true because there are studies which show that uh, the, the, the countries can be uh, quite different, quite heterogeneous uh, in nature. Now, Redatz does... Uh, acknowledge that, and he just 
sort of simply states in his paper that low-income countries, they tend to be relatively homogeneous. We're not mixing up low-income countries with middle-income countries. But nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, strong assumption, and that, that's acknowledged by Rodatz. And if this assumption fails, according to Pesseron and Smith, then the impact of the shocks on economic variables will be inaccurately estimated. The other explanatory variables that they use in all these past studies is a single commodity index, which is the Deaton and Miller index, which uh, is a popular index which is used in studies. And what um, we have seen in the literature, especially the, the, the current literature on commodity prices, is that these commodities behave quite differently. Even among categories such as beverages, coffee, cocoa, and tea, for example, they behave quite differently. They have different dynamics. Even metals like zinc, copper, and lead, they have different dynamics. So to put them together as one commodity index, as has been done in past studies, seems to me uh, to be uh, a fairly restrictive assumption. And also that's been, I've just recently found out a paper by Euselius, Moller, and Tarp in the Oxford Bulletin of Economics and Statistics, where they have lucidly listed the advantages of using time series, thank you, time series methods uh, over, over other methods such as panel and cross-section. So I'll quickly move through this. Uh, th th this. This would be the standard VAR model that would be used if one were to look at a linear approach, which has been used in past studies. All past studies which have used that panel VAR and panel ECM have used a linear approach. So basically what we have over here, you've got the B21 uh, coefficient in the second equation, for example. If that is uh, found to be significant, those coefficients, then you could say that X could have some causal relationship on Y. So X could be commodity prices, Y could be uh, GDP per capita, right? Now, what we uh, do over here is we introduce this extra term, which is XT plus, which is basically the model of Mork. And this is not what Mork actually did. He had a single equation model. What we're doing over here is we are borrowing the model of Killian and Vigfusson, which was published in Quantitative Economics 2011. So we're using the same type of model that they've used. So that XT plus, it's got the coefficient G21. If those coefficients are significant, then simply that means that the XT plus, which actually senses out the positive changes in uh, commodity prices, they, they can have a causal effect on uh, GDP, which is measured by Y, if those coefficients are significant. And in that way, B21 coefficients in the second equation would pick up the negative shock. So you're separating out the, separating out the positive and negative shocks. Now, Hamilton uses a slightly more complex model where you have X plus net, which simply means a sustained increase in, in commodity prices, which is measured by this max function over here, and uh, N, which is set equal to 3. That's the typical uh, sort of period that Hamilton uses in his studies, and we, we're going we're gonna to use that same uh, level as well. So again, G21 measures the, that positive sustained uh, effect on, on GDP. And then we uh, compute the impulse response functions if we find that there is asymmetry in these types of uh, uh, VAR models. And that simply is calculated by looking at one standard deviation shock, which could be positive or negative, which is denoted by delta. And H is the time horizon, which we choose in this data set to be five years. So the data that we used is GDP measured in constant prices. I'm going to quickly go through this. We use the Grilly-Yang Index. This is a very popularly used index in commodity price studies. The sample period is 1960 to 2010, simply based on the sample size that's available. And we carefully choose nine agricultural commodities that are closely related to the GDP uh, uh, per capita that is available for uh, various countries. So just to give some idea, a set of graphs over here, and as you can see, as Deaton and Miller suggest, you've got these uh, sharp spikes, which can tend to be uh, persistent at times. Some basic statistics about the studies. There is a fair degree of persistence, which is picked up by the autoregressive thank you, uh, parameters, AR1 and AR2. There's a fair amount of coefficient of variation. The skewness is positive, as we would expect. The number of positive spikes outweighs the number of negative spikes. And again, I'll just quickly whiz through this. You've got uh, different countries listed over here, and you've got the, the commodities, which I found out from the FAO weight, uh, database and uh, other related studies, where there's a fair amount of dependence just on one single agricultural commodity. Now, these are the tests that we have over here. If we were to look at the Mork model that we talked about, you can see that there are four uh, different uh, uh, countries uh, which seem to be affected by this asymmetric uh, uh, shock. So if they are positive shocks, you can see that you can separate out from them, them out from the negative shocks, and they tend to be uh, quite significant. Uh, in the case of the Hamilton model, there's only evidence of two 
cases, but one of them, that's Cameroon, when compared with the, with the linear model, which is given by the last column, uh, the linear model gives a better fit when I use the model selection criteria. So in the case of the Hamilton unit type model, you've only got one, uh, uh, one uh, particular case, which is Cote d'Ivoire. But nonetheless, it's a very important country because, as we saw from the previous table, a fair amount of dependency on one single commodity, which is cocoa, for the case of Cote d'Ivoire. And then, given that we find that there are five countries which have uh, found to be asymmetric, I've included Cameroon as well, just as a comparison. We do this impulse response function, so it's uh, an innovation accounting uh, uh, exercise. And we calculate the responses due to positive and negative shocks. And what happens is we find out whether the differences are significant enough. So the graphs would look somewhat like this. I'll just quickly show them what the graphs look like. And then we find out whether the differences between these graphs are significant using these p-values. And as you can see that uh, in the case of Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Malawi, they're quite significantly different. But then uh, over time, some of them tend to be not so different, but some, sometimes the difference uh, persists. So finally, thank you. We're on the last, sorry. <laughs> last uh, slide, we find that there is, uh, if you take the linear case, which has been chosen in most studies, there, is, uh, there are about six countries which show that there's a causal relationship between commodity prices and economic growth. But we find that just as many countries can have an asymmetric response. And that complicates the whole uh, policy-making issue because then you've got these uh, positive and negative shocks, which can be quite different. And given that countries are advised to accumulate reserves during the, good, uh, uh, do, 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 during the good times and spend them during the bad times, setting this rule can be quite difficult given this uh, evidence of asymmetric uh, uh, responses that, that, that exist. Uh, on this complicated note, I'll finish it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh